As has been our custom in past years, we devote this period to a visit with our music commentator, James Fassett, in the green room at Carnegie Hall. With him today is Giancarlo Minotti, composer of the operas, the medium, and the console. Now, let's join Mr. Fassett and Mr. Minotti in their transcribed conversation in the green room. There have been so many conflicting reports, Giancarlo, about what happened the opening night of the console at La Scala in Milan, that it seems a good idea to clear up those stories right away. What happened that night in Milan? Well, Jim, I'm glad you're asking me that because so many people think that the council at La Scala was a great fiasco and actually it was one of the most exciting evening I ever had, uh, the sort of evening that a composer dreams of, you know, with people fighting in the audience and so on. And it was really quite an extraordinary uh, story because the, uh, it was all organized by a critic in Milan. Uh, it, he was one of the most, uh, I, I don't, don't like to call him a distinguished critic, but I say critic of one of the most distinguished papers in Milan. And he came to the general rehearsal of the council and uh, evidently hated it. So uh, the evening of the performance, he sent a note to Dr. Giringelli, who was the director of La Scala, uh, telling him that he, uh, he uh, did not want to use his the usual two seats because he wanted to have the privilege of booing the council. So he uh, took uh, three or four boxes and filled them with friends and pupils. Of course, he is himself a composer. I should not forget to say that. That's what <clears throat> he is. And then uh, at the beginning of the... Uh, and Giringelli warned me of that evening of the performance. He said, we must expect trouble. So I asked him whether I should warn the singers, and he said, no, better not, otherwise they'll get nervous. So the first act went by quite peacefully, and, and we had uh, quite a success with it. They tried to start trouble during the first act, but the rest of the audience uh, shushed them. Then the second act began, and when we arrived at the scene of the magician, they started booing and uh, screaming and whistling, <clears throat> cat calling, all sorts of things. But again, the rest of the audience uh, made them keep quiet. But at the end of Magda's big scene, the big aria, then there was no stopping them. They made such a racket we had to stop the performance for 10 minutes. And with people hitting each other, the police had to come and take some people away. And the pool singers were just standing uh, uh, on the stage not knowing what to do. And uh, I had two American singers in the cast, uh, Andrew McKinley, who did the part of the magician, and Marie Powers, because she was not on the stage at that moment. But poor uh, McKinley did not know what to do. He had never seen in, in, any, any such uh, uh, performance in the audience. And he was absolutely white with fear. He thought a revolution had broken out. Isn't there a pretty and good precedent in Italy for that sort of thing in the opening well, night? Of well, actually, I, I was told that um, it's, it's the first stormy evening at La Scala uh, since, uh, I, think, um, I think, Madame Butterfly, really of that caliber. I mean, it's... Uh, I was rather proud of that. Well, I should say, <laughs> Madame Butterfly succeeded in uh, surviving oh, at well, least, I, didn't I, I would be very happy if I could say the same thing about the council. Well, we did have a very... At the end, we, we had uh, 25 curtain calls, which is uh, quite nice. That was the opening night only. You that, continued yes. to play there. And, uh, yes, all the, the other nights... Uh, quiet. The, uh, completely quiet. But they went fighting on fighting even after the performance, out in front of La Scala. Uh, people just went on... Uh, fighting amongst uh, each other, and uh, oh, quite, well, we had quite a few broken noses. There were no political implications in this? Involved. Well, I, d I don't think so. Of course, there, there were here and there um, calls of da um, down with America and uh, down with the Marshall Plan and all sorts of things. And well, Milan is the center, isn't it, of, um, of well, communist Yes, Italy? there is a great deal of, of communism in, it, in, um, in Milan. Do you think that has anything but, to do No, with because Confalonieri actually writes for a rather conservative paper, so that was only a sideline. He must have a good many friends in Milan if he could fill four boxes. Well, I, I'm proud <laughs> to say that he doesn't have as many friends now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to get that straight, Giancarlo. Let's get to the subject that uh, is interesting to all of us because the film of the medium opened here in New York only a few weeks ago. I'm happy to say I was able to see it the second day. It was filmed in Rome. Yes. And you directed it. I did. And it was the first film you've ever directed. Yes. Did you find mm -hmm. the um, experience you've had directing on the stage to be a help or a hindrance in directing the film? Uh, 
Well, I, I, I would say neither. I think it's a completely different approach. And um, I was rather uh, disturbed at the beginning because uh, I found out that really to be a good director, I mean, you should know something about the camera. I think it's pretty obvious. I don't know why I never thought of that before. <laughs> and suddenly when I was asked whether I want to have a... a, a a 75 uh, millimeter lens or a 50 or I just didn't know what you they were know. talking about yeah. and that was rather upsetting also there is a whole problem of the angle you know if a person leaves the screen at the left you must uh, show it coming in at the right and all things that I didn't know anything about so I'd, for the first week or so I really had a pretty horrible time trying to learn things but after that it came quite easy well did most of the uh, shots come to you were they planned beforehand accurately or did you uh, work them out as you... Progressed? No, actually, I did plan most of the shots in advance, but then I found out that I, I prefer to improvise, and actually, by looking into the camera, I could find much better shots than those that I had planned before. So we improvised a great deal of it to, to the producer's despair, but it was really great fun. Of course, the technique of making a, a, a film is, is very different from that of the stage, and it's very taxing on the singers. Because, as you know, we recorded the opera first, and uh, then the records were played to the singers while they acted out the, the story. That's just the reverse of the usual way, isn't it? Yes. What I films, can you think of any film that has been uh, done that way before? Uh, uh, not, not an opera, but I know that um, Eisenstein uh, did something like it with Prokofiev in, uh, in some of, of, of his films. Prokofiev wrote the music first, and Eisenstein uh, fitted the film uh, on, on the musical pattern. But that, of course, it isn't as difficult as having a voice. Can you imagine a singer having to act, and uh, act as well as she can, and at the same time have to watch her lips, because, of course, they had to sing with the record. And sometimes, just for a, if they miss the uh, synchronization by a split second, we have to throw away the over. whole uh, shot again. But it might be a particularly good one that you couldn't of repeat course, exactly. Of many of the best shots we simply had to, to destroy because the synchronization wasn't good. And none of the people in the cast had ever been in a film, in a movie before, had they? None of them, none of them. It's really uh, quite extraordinary how they, they quickly learned how to do it. And um, uh, I, th I think that in general, uh, for, for, uh, for a singer, it's a, uh, it's a relief not to have to... Um, sing always straight to an audience. I mean, it's, it's great fun to be able to, for the first time in their lives, actually to, be, to sing and turn any way they want and not having to force their voice and all that. But the problem of synchronization is, is very, difficult. very difficult. And well, actually, I don't think that an opera will ever be filmed completely successfully unless we can do away with that. Because it's too difficult for, a, for an actress to have to think constantly about yes. moving her lips together with the record. One of the scenes that I found most affecting wasn't in the stage production at all. That was the fair scene. Oh, the fair scene. It was a wonderful scene. I'm glad you liked it. Do you make the, make the scene separately? Or well, I thought of the fair scene because of one idea that um, came to my mind, which I don't... It's an idea that I don't know whether it ever comes across on, on, uh, in the screen or not. It's the idea of the parrot. I wanted to have the mute boy uh, when Toby gets lost in the crowd and he's a, he's a mute and he's confronted by parrots. And the idea, the tragic idea in it, is actually this human being who is confronted, uh, who cannot talk, who is confronted by an animal who can talk. And, and that is that's yes. what really gave me the, the idea of the fair scene. How did you find the characters in the fair scene? Oh, that was really great fun, because um, all you have to do in Rome is just to put a movie camera in the middle of the street. <laughs> and uh, in about five seconds, you have a crowd around you. Or, and you find the most extraordinary types. So I never, I never used any of the professional uh, crowd people that you find in studios. I just, we just go with the camera on the street and said, let's wait. And in about, oh, really five minutes, I had such an extraordinary choice of people. Then I would just go around and say, I want this one, this one, this one. And that's the way we did it, all the time. Did you find the, the, uh, the dwarf that way? We found one dwarf that way. The other one we did get from a professional fair. The one with the horrible voice. The one with the horrible voice. <laughs> it was good to talk to you, Giancarlo. Giancarlo Minotti transcribed this conversation with me for today's broadcast in the green room at Carnegie Hall. <laughs>